same as all of you in this room, I just used to do really weird voices, right? Just in my bedroom, just doing weird voices. And uh, uh, when I moved to Southern California, to San Diego, what's up, San Diego? I met a few of you in San Diego. Um, I signed with my first agent, it was the Carol Shane Price Agency, and uh, I had been doing commercial work for them, doing some commercials for the San Diego Padres. And my agent said, hey, are you interested in doing some voiceover? And I was like, yeah, okay. And um, that's kind of how it got started. I started off doing software, uh, math software for schools and things like that. And, uh, and then kind of commercials came from that, and some other things, video games came out of that. And so it was kind of a natural progression, but it all started by just practicing my voice and trying to figure out what I could do with my voice. Did you have like a favorite voice that you did when you were younger? Yeah, I always wanted to do announcer stuff. I always wanted to be up there going, okay, ladies and gentlemen, now coming up down from the you know, doing that kind of thing. Yeah! And uh, so that's kind of what was my first few jobs, was doing announcer stuff and being a little pukey in radio. <laughs> and then kind of the character stuff kind of came in later. Yeah. What about you, Pete? How did you start this out? Well, I succeed. I put it same as all you guys. I was always doing voices as a kid. Um, Pee Wee Herman was my inspiration back in the day. I, I don't think I can do that anymore. I've hit puberty and then some. So, uh, and then, uh, and then when I went to college, uh, just like uh, you know, uh, you were thinking you, were, you wanted to be an announcer. I wanted to be a DJ. So I went to this guy. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for listening to the WSUR. This is Marvin Goodnight. And that was how I started, was, was doing radio voiceover. Uh, and then, uh, I, when I went to, uh, I'm from New Jersey, so I was in New York City, and my first job was in, it was in radio. Uh, and they were like, hey, you should make a voiceover demo. And so I made a, I went and paid and had a voiceover demo recorded. And that was when, Casting first started, so this was way back in the day, and uh, and I put my demo up there, and that is when Four Kids Productions uh, came a knocking. Shout out to Jason Griffith over there. Who I'm afraid to leave Jason and my wife in the same place. I know we're all married, but she just thinks he's so handsome. because naturally my voice is somewhat deeper. Um, and I was leaving the studio after uh, auditioning for a Ninja Turtles baddie that I did not get. Well, don't worry, I didn't get it, so you don't have to cheer. Uh, and uh, on my way out, they said, hey, 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 Pete, uh, would, you tr would you mind trying this 14-year-old hedgehog? And I was like, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. Uh, and they said, here's this dude with a chip on his shoulder, uh, who's fighting for the future, and then the rest is, is history. Here we are. Here we <laughs> we'll do the voices, I promise, I promise. I know that's what you're here for. Uh, so, uh, but Ryan, so you still do, uh, you know, you're not just in the Sonic universe, you do a lot of voices and you do a lot of voiceover stuff, like, uh, what, what is it that attracts you to this, to this business? That's actually a really good question, you know, because most people think that voiceover is all about doing voices, and it's really not about that. I mean, that helps, because if you can do a number of voices, that helps you being uh, castable. But really, the whole thing is to be a good actor, because people want it, you know, you always want voiceovers to sound natural. You don't want it to sound like you're, you're reading a script. You want it to sound like it's real life. And so, being an actor all my whole life, I always was fascinated about how um, voiceover was all about the voice and you couldn't rely on facial expressions, you couldn't rely on body language. It all had to be through this one, one medium, which is just the voice. And I always find that to be fascinating and challenging and really fun. So, the number one question I always get, which is, you know, how do you get into voiceover? What do I do to get into voiceovers? My answer is always take acting classes. Take acting classes. Are any of you guys out here in acting classes right now? All right, a bunch of you are. That's great. That's awesome. Uh, uh, Ryan, I couldn't agree with you more. 
sure. So uh, we're both actors by trade. Uh, I actually do more film and TV stuff than I do voiceover stuff. Uh, and I think that lends itself so much to the voice acting, because like Ryan said, uh, you know, the only thing you guys hear is that voice, but I bet you if you saw either of us in a voiceover booth, you would not, you would laugh your butts off, because I'm acting everything out as I'm going, trying to bring, bring this character to life. I assume you're, you're doing the same thing? All the time, yeah. Uh, what I've been doing a lot of late, lately is uh, Halloween decorations. For those of you who ever shop at Spirit Halloween or Halloween City, you know, Target and all that. Big shout out to Spirit Halloween, huh? Yeah, totally. So, if you ever have seen footage of me in the booth doing some sort of weird, like, demonic skeleton or something, I am uh, pretty demonic, actually. It's completely the opposite of Sonic the Hedgehog. It's all like, yeah, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> That's just kind of how it is. You have to act it out in the booth as you're doing it. I found myself when I was doing Silver, um, I was like, uh, oh, oh, how about that? Hey, light! Now I don't feel like I'm in somebody's basement. Uh, when I was doing Silver, I found myself that, uh, like Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. I was always like this. It's no use! Because body posture, uh, uh, you know, be, being able to pull from your diaphragm, just uh, like the way you're standing, the way you're moving, the way you're presenting yourself is all so important. So I hope you guys, when you are thinking about getting into voice acting, uh, I, please, please, please know that voice acting is called voice acting and not voiceover for a reason, because you are actors when you're doing so. Yeah, the having funny voices is just not enough. I mean, it's great to have, because obviously if someone is looking to cast a game and it has ten characters in it, and you can do five of those characters, then they only have to find another guy to do five, or a gal to do five, and then they only have to hire two actors instead of ten. And that saves people money. And that's what they always want to do, is save money. So the more you can do, the more money you can save them, that's the more valuable that you are. But you have to be able to act it out as well as do the different voices. Do you have do you have a favorite role that you've done outside of the man himself, Sonic the Hedgehog? Wow. Sorry to put you on the spot. I know I've got to, it's like Sophie's Choice. I gotta think of um, I'm gonna get back to you on that. I know I have one. Great, great. We'll revisit that question. We'll revisit it. Hey Josh! Give again, give a Josh over here. Uh, Josh was here to, to moderate this panel and we, we completely steamrolled him and took over. Uh, but jo Josh, do you have any questions that you may, might want to ask us? Look, he's prepared. He's got them written down. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you need a minute too? Do, is this just a bunch of pauses? Okay, go, yeah, go, rip, let one rip. I guess, uh, let's see here. Uh, I mean, you pretty much already answered two of them, so. <laughs> yeah, hey, we're ahead. Yeah, we're very good. Yeah, yes, indeed. <laughs> There's a reason I haven't been talking much. Also, uh, I guess I can throw one thing in here. Um, who would you say would be your biggest influences in terms of, uh, I mean, I guess, I don't know if you, I mean, I guess we can say voiceover, but like obviously y'all do stuff outside of that, so performing in general, I would say. That's a great question. Uh, mine, I come from a very uh, theater and comedy background, and the person that I feel like uh, envelops or enveloped, unfortunately, uh, all of those things was Robin Williams, a guy who could do voices, comedy, drama. He's a guy that could do everything. So, you know, that's somebody that I always looked up to where I was just like, oh, I'm watching him go bananas on stage and he's sweating and he's disgusting and he doesn't care because he's making everyone laugh. And then the next moment he's doing Goodwill Hunting and he's making me cry. So uh, it, it's stuff like that that really excites me. How about you, Ryan? Yeah, I know I have a famous person that I, that I really looked up to, but like my favorite actor of all time is Brad Dourif. I don't know if he, yes, Brad Dourif. Is he here? No. Um, yeah. Um, he's been in a million di different films, and just the man is just an absolute killer actor. And that's what's always uh, impressed me most. 
is just the people who can really suck me in and make me think that they really are the character. That just uh, that thrills me to no end. Brad Dourif. And also, if, if I had to pick a famous person, I'd probably say Steve Martin. Steve Martin yeah. is just, again, speaking of somebody who can make you laugh, and then can make you cry, and then make you laugh while you're crying. I mean, fantastic. You know, I, I, was, I was actually watching uh, a video of Steve Martin this morning. Uh, oddly enough, or maybe it was late last night, I don't know, these days are running together. And um, someone said, hey Steve, uh, you know, the question I get to ask the most is, uh, how do I break into Hollywood? Um, and his answer isn't like, you know, hey, this is how you get an agent, this is how you do this. He said, always be the best at what you do. And that is such a great answer to just, so it's not just coming up with the voice, it's knowing what's behind it, it's knowing what the character involves, like what's in their heart, what's in their soul, what's in their past. And I think that's really important for you guys to think about as you're coming up in this business, is to really like create a character that's not just a voice, but that's a full thing. Because if I said to you, uh, if I said to you, uh, tell me about you, and then you just did your voice, that tells me nothing about you. I want to know about what you love, what you hate, what bothers you, what, what makes you sad, what makes you happy, and all that stuff's so important to think about when you're doing these characters. And also, I think a really important thing to do is, if you want to get into this business, is to be at peace with auditions. Auditions are things that you do far more often than you actually do jobs. I think the, the statistic is still like, you have to audition 50 times to get one job. I think that's still true. Um, it's always been true, I think. Yeah. And for a lot of actors, and you guys probably know an actor who's like this, maybe the one that you see in the mirror in the morning, who loves acting but they hate auditions. And if you ever hear some an actor say, oh, I just can't stand auditions, I love acting but I can't stand auditions, to me that always sounds like, I'm a veterinarian but I can't stand animals. Like, it doesn't make any sense. I'm a painter but I can't stand paint. It doesn't make any sense. You gotta be, like, auditions, being at peace with auditions, is probably the most useful thing you can do as an actor. And the way to do that, in case you were curious, is to be, just like Pete was saying, always be the best in the room, be prepared. If they ask you for a monologue, bring four. If they ask you to bring a headshot, bring 10. If they ask you to sing a song, bring five. You know, always be over-prepared. If you're ever going into an audition and going, oh, please don't ask me for something else, or I just want to get out of here, that is the attitude that's going to sink you every time. But if you go into an audition and you can stand up there in front of this casting table and go, come on, what you got? Ask me a question, I got it. Ask me for a song, I got it. Ask me for a monologue. You want Shakespeare, you want contemporary. Whatever you got, whatever you want, I've got it. And if you're over-prepared like that, that's what makes you the best in the room, and that makes you very, very attractive to people who cast. Someone once told me that the audition is the job, and the booking is the reward. Exactly. And they're not the same. Really Auditions are different than the job. It's almost like auditioning to be a painter, and for the audition you have to make a sculpture. It's like they're not the same thing. Auditioning is a different kind of animal. It's a different kind of skill than acting. It's, it's just, it's weird, but you gotta get good at auditioning. And if you hate auditioning, figure out why and figure out how to change that. I think another thing that, um, that uh, I always stress, so I, I, I teach a lot of classes, um, and I, the thing I stress to my students and the thing I'd like to stress to all of you, because uh, I think it is, a, if, if, if you were to ask me what's the one thing you want me to walk away with from this panel, this is the one thing. The only thing, <laughs> The only thing uh, that you can bring to a part that no one else can is yourself. So if Ryan and I are auditioning for the same part, we see the same things on the screen, we have the same sides, we have the same director, so a, a million people are gonna can read that the same way. The one thing that you bring to an audition that is so important is you. The, what makes you unique? Do you, do you have a list? Awesome, who cares? It's not a, it's not a defect, it's a great thing. Thing. Is your voice higher than most people? Awesome. Great. That's you. It's, it's embracing what you are and who you are and just making that what pushes you forward. Yeah. Right. Josh, you got another question? Or do you want to you wanna turn it over to some audience questions? Alright, cool. All right. uh, well, I, Ruben was the first to
when coming in for these characters, when you guys first came into characters, what was like your main motivation for Sonic and Silver? Main motivation for the characters? That's the question? Yeah. Mine was always energy. Sonic is always fast, and he was a teenager, and like, it was just energy, energy, energy. So, that was what every, like, almost it seemed like every uh, session that I had recording the voice of Sonic was like, I felt like I was boxing 12 rounds. Because everything was pushed and energetic, and, you know, he doesn't say anything quiet. <laughs> it's always, yeah, this is happening, yeah! I just like try doing that eight hours a day. It's like, oh my gosh, okay, yeah. But yeah, energy, number one, lightning in a bottle. What about you? Uh, so when I went in, uh, I had it was a little different of, of an experience because um, Silver was a new character and they had this crazy storyline for him. So, you know, uh, they were like, okay, here's a hedgehog, he's 14 years old, he's from the future, he's traveling to the past to save the future, and he thinks that Sonic is the one that messed up the future, so he's coming back to kill him. Uh, and so, Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, the one thing, uh, the one thing that they said to me that really stuck with me is this is a teenager with a chip on his shoulder. And I was a teenager with a chip on his shoulder. So I was just like, okay, well, how would 13 or 14 year old Pete, who just wanted to be cool, uh, how would he, uh, you know, how would he do deliver these lines? So my motivation was always like, here's a dude who's, he's fighting for something way bigger than himself. He's trying to fight for the future of the world. Uh, but he's 14 years old, and that's a lot for a teenager to take on. And so that was always in my head, was what is this chip on his shoulder, and how is he going to find it? Good question, Great Ruben. Question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys, he's got a Dreamcast! You! Alright, anybody else? Uh, yeah, you and the Tales cosplay, move on up. Tales. So Ryan, um, yeah. so there was this, um, was there a band that you were involved in, the AYU Quartet? Yes. Look at you doing your homework. That's kind of creepy. I like that. You're <laughs> a big fan. Yeah. A big fan of your Sonic. I'm always indebted. Uh, yeah. I, well, back in the early 90s, for those of you who were alive. Uh, most of them were not. Yeah. Was a huge thing, and it kind of started off. Uh, the thing that kickstarted it was Boys to Men. They did a song called "It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday." It was a cappella, and, and it then, goes a little. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and all these a cappella groups kind of came out of that. And um, and I was in college at the time, and I had three friends, and we were like, let's form an a cappella group. And so we started off calling ourselves as yet untitled, and we thought that was such an original, cool title. <laughs> until nobody got it right. Everyone was like, and please welcome to the stage, as yet untalented. <laughs> welcome to the stage, uh, Brigham Young University. You know, it's like, it, they never got it right. So we just changed it to the AYU Quartet. And I'm always indebted to those guys because we were able to sing a cappella and make a living at it for five years. Which is, you have a lot of a cappella too, who doesn't, right? I think people who don't love a cappella, people who haven't heard a cappella. Um, and that's actually what brought me from, I'm from Michigan originally, and that's what brought me from Michigan to California. I moved with my quartet to San Diego, and um, we were, we sang on cruise ships, we opened for Soupy Sales, we opened for Bill Cosby, we did a bunch of really cool gigs, and that's what able, was able to bring me to, um, to California, and which ended up being a really good thing, because that's how my voiceover career started, was being in San Diego. Did you have a favorite a cappella cover that you did? A favorite a cappella cover? Yeah, probably, um, <laughs> we used to do The Lion Sleeps Tonight, and, um, and I'm a baritone by nature, but the other guys were tenors, and so I always had to sing the bass part, and then the other three guys fought for the other three parts. But um, we would always kind of start these, well, they call them flash mobs now, but we used to kind of start these guerrilla performances where I would walk out like on a street corner and go, beam away, oh, beam away, oh, beam away, oh, beam away, hey. And then they would come in, and we would sing this song. So that was 
was that was kind of what brought me to California. And actually, doing acapella for five years also taught me a lot about how my voice worked. And it, um, we were a busy group at one point. This is the. <laughs> It's a humble brag, I suppose, but in the holiday season in 1995, we had one weekend where we had 23 gigs. We had nine on Friday, eight on Saturday, and seven on Sunday. So since we were singing all the time, I had to figure out how to sing correctly, how to do voices correctly. And now, I finally, at the age of I've, I've learned how to do it correctly. And so I can talk, or I can do voices, all day long, every day, and not lose my voice. And that's, that's all about technique. That's all learning how to, if you think about a newborn baby, newborn babies, those of you, Jason Griffith has this nine month old son. And this is going to be the first to tell you that babies can scream all day long. And they never lose their voice. And why is that? Why can babies scream at the top of their lungs all day and never lose their voice? Because they learn to breathe correctly. They, you come out into this world learning how to breathe correctly. So there is a way to do it, you just have to learn to use your breath and keep tension out of your throat and all those things. And uh, singing a acapella for five years really kind of taught me how to do that and that has helped me immeasurably in my voiceover career. You know, uh, just to, to, to add on to that, um, I was never in an acapella group, but uh, that technique is so important. Uh, when I recorded Silver the first time, so all of that, that, that entire 06 game, it was the dead of winter in New York City, and I was sick as a dog, and I legitimately had no voice. But when you, even if you have no voice, you can still, if you're breathing correctly, can force that voice out in, in the proper way. And so it was a, a million gallons of tea, and just knowing how to properly use my diaphragm to get that silver voice out. So train, train everybody. Sonic character? Divisive, very divisive. <laughs> I'm gonna go out. I'm gonna go out on this one. I I don't know if you'll agree with me, but I really like Sonic. <laughs> I do. I'm sorry. I mean, I think you probably thought I'd say something else, but I love Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah. It's a, he's pretty popular, huh? I hear he is. Yeah, he's got a couple of games, couple of movies, couple of TV shows. Yeah, they made a movie or something. I don't yeah. Know. I, I'm actually, I like Tails. Look at you. Yeah, I like Tails. Tails is really cool. I mean, it's adorable. Plus, yeah. Colleen, Emmy, we got Tails. Awesome, awesome voice actress. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, you over there. What you got? Okay, so my question is, what is your favorite Sonic, uh, from Sonic Adventure 1 and Sonic Heroes, what is your favorite Sonic scene? And uh, what is your favorite Silver scene? Favorite Sonic scene? <laughs> Just because it's so iconic, the opening scene to Sonic Adventure is always kind of my favorite. When <laughs> he's like, he's gonna crash! That's not how I remember saying that line. <laughs> Why did that turn out like that? That just makes me laugh every time. Yeah. How about you, Pete? Uh, my favorite was so before before the game, before I ever recorded for the game, they called me in to do uh, the the trailer that was going to play at E3 that year. And so to this day, what what really still sticks in my heart is just. Uh, because Silver wasn't in the trailer at first, you know, like the whole trailer goes through and then at the end, they just show him like silhouetted on top of a mountain looking down and he, when he says, I finally found him, the Iblis Trigger. Yeah, I just love that scene. But I think it's really funny that you bring up how you think you recorded a line and how yeah. the line came out, because yeah. that is a, that, that is crazy. Yeah. I remember for the first game, they just 
gave us not a script, we didn't have a script, it was just a list of lines. And in that list of lines, we had no idea who we were talking to, we had no idea why we were saying it, we didn't know if the person we were talking to was two feet away or two miles away. And so that's why some of the things in the game, just like, they don't quite match. Well, yeah, we didn't quite know what we were doing. We just had a list of words on the page. It was like, say these words. Like, okay. Yeah, I mean, even for 06, that was a giant script. Um, but we were never really kind of informed what was what. And also, and I'm sure Jason remembers this too, uh, we were, uh, we were, there was, it was, the voiceover actor, there was a, an American director, a translator, and a Japanese director. And so lots of things got lost in translation of like what they actually wanted. Uh, so I, half the time I had no idea what the hell I was even saying. <laughs> The Sonic Adventure 2, I've told this story before, some of you probably know it, but there was about five Japanese folks that were there in the room and then one translator, and every line they would confer amongst themselves and then the translator would be like, okay, 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 and then he would turn to me and he would tell them, tell me what they said. And at one point I was doing some line and there was a whole bunch of chatter out in the room and they were like, oh, no, 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 and the translator was like, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, okay. And then he came to me and he was like, they said do it faster, but slower. <laughs> I was like, what? And yeah, do it faster, but slower. I was like, that's what they said, that's what they said. I was like, how do I do that? And he's like, I don't know, man, just do it different. <laughs> and so I did it different, not faster or slower, just different. And they were like, oh, good, yes, good, good, good. Yeah. Sometimes you can hit it on the head, and sometimes you have no idea flying blind. Let's see, you down there, I guess, with the, uh, the grayish. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, you first, and then, and then you afterwards. Yes, go right up. You should just say whoever can get to the mic first and have a mad dash. Um, hello. Hi. Uh, so, um, what is your, like, favorite, most cherished memory in relation to the Sonic franchise, and to add on that, what is the weirdest slash funniest, like, memory of you related to Sonic? Favorite memory and weirdest memory. Uh, I'll go first, because mine are the same. Um, Be efficient. Yeah, well, it is, it is, it is being at, at uh, the first Sonic convention in 2010, when it was, it was myself and Jason and Mike Pollock and Lisa Ortiz. Um, and it was just so lovely. It was my first introduction to the fandom of, of Sonic. And it was, I could not believe that we had this effect on so many people. I just thought that was amazing. So that was like the most cherished part. And then the weirdest part was uh, doing karaoke uh, with Jason Griffith. Uh, late night in a private karaoke room and not realizing he's the reincarnation of Elvis Presley. And I bet you, uh, if you give him enough money or beg him enough, he will sing at least a bar of an Elvis uh, song for you. And it is, he's so good, it's bonkers. So that's my craziest thing. I think he ran away so we wouldn't call him up here to make him do that. As soon as you said his name, he was out. Um, my most cherished memory, I don't know if it's, it's a little bit funny and a little bit weird, um, was that when I was, it was in 1998, I think, somebody out there is gonna know better than I, and uh, I was doing a show at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego, it was How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and, uh, and I was, it was in auditions? No, 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 it was uh, rehearsals. I was in rehearsals for it, and my agent called up and said, they need you to fly to New York tomorrow to be on the Rosie O'Donnell show. Because Rosie O'Donnell, every year, she had this talk show, and every year at the holidays, she would do like a Toys for Tots drive, and she was gonna be giving away 10,000 Sonic plushies. Maybe one of you got one. And, uh, and so they were like, we need you, we have this guy who's gonna be in a costume of Sonic, and he's gonna be on stage. And then we need you to sit off stage and provide the voice of, you know, and you can talk to Rosie O'Donnell, you know, through this, and the costume character's just gonna go, and I'm gonna talk, right? And 
And so it was this whole big production where it's like I had to get out of rehearsals for the show I was in. I was flown to New York. There was a guy holding, it was the first time in my life I had a guy holding a sign with my name on it at the airport, which was pretty awesome. I got an actual limousine ride, you know, into Manhattan. They put me up at this really nice hotel. It was a whole big thing, right? It was just fancy. And I'm not a fancy person, as you can tell by my shoes. And, um, and so, but it was interesting because it was like, oh, this is cool. And um, so the day of the taping, I'm walking through Rockefeller Center. Oh, and side note, I ran into, um, I almost got shoulder checked by Will Ferrell. <laughs> it was his, his third year on SNL and I walked past him in the hall and he almost shoulder checked me and I was like, holy crap, that was Will Ferrell, you know? He wasn't the movie star yet, he was just the SNL guy, but still cool. And I walked in there and they were just like, okay, we're gonna have you have this mic. And, uh, and I said, I'm supposed to sit off stage somewhere, and they're like, well, we're actually going to have you in this booth where the announcer sits, and you're going to watch the show on a monitor, and you're going to talk into the... And so, anyway, long story, painfully long, they, um, they had it all set up, and it was live in front of a studio audience, and she, uh, she was like, we got a friend coming out through the curtain, and the Sonic the Hedgehog costume character came out, and she's like, hi, Sonic, how you doing? And I'm like, hi, Rosie, you know? And turns out, she couldn't hear me. Like, through all of this preparation and all of the flying me across the country, they had forgotten to put my voice through the monitor. This, this is great. You know, give away these plushies. Fantastic. And all this stuff. And, uh, and, so, and she's ignoring me. She's totally giving me the cold shoulder, and I have no idea why. And it turns out she didn't know I was talking. So, if you ever see footage of this, I have a VHS copy of it somewhere. Yeah, old school. And if you ever see it, it's hilarious. It's not that long, but it's like you hear me talking, and you hear and you see Rosie O'Donnell just going, "Well, anyway, I'm giving away these toys." <laughs> Over here. Over here. You know. So it was really, really bizarre. Flying all the way to New York to be ignored by Rosie O'Donnell <laughs> is my cherished memory. <laughs> uh, anyway, all right. Uh, yes, you and the uh, the white shirt. Come on. Uh, my daughter's a big fan and was wondering if you could do a, big, a quick skit or voice impression for <laughs> A skit? We're going to improv. Yeah! Let's do it. Wow. So, Silver, what should we have for lunch? I'm starving. In the future, we don't even eat lunch. You're always talking about the future. I want to know what to eat today. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, I know you're always talking about these chili dog things. So now you're talking. All I right. chili dog. Or nine. <laughs> You know what? I resist, but it's no use! I don't know, that sounded like a tagline. It is a tagline! In the future, it's all taglines! Well played, Silver. Are we gonna eat lunch, or are we just gonna go to the future? Fine, no, we'll eat lunch. <laughs> I win! What are we having? Well, it's gonna be chili dogs! It's no use! Okay! what's happening. <laughs> I have the mic. Um, <laughs> Dean Bristow, rest in peace, Dean. Uh, one of the kindest guys. Um, just one of those guys, similar to Mike Pollock, who's just done everything. And, uh, and I was kind of new in the voiceover scene, and he had been in it a long, long time. He had been doing it for decades when I met him. And um, Deem actually, this is kind of interesting about Deem, is that he uh, grew up in the Midwest and he ended up being a judge for aspiring voiceover artists. And he one time was judging a talent show at a high school in Kettering, Ohio. 
and he was judging uh, people doing talents, and this one young lady got up and did this voice, and he was like, yeah, she's pretty good. And that voice was Nancy Cartwright, and she was doing the voice of Bart Simpson. But she had not been cast as Bart Simpson, there was no Bart Simpson. But, so, but he met her when she was just an aspiring voiceover actress, and he was like, she's really talented, she should, you know, be on a 30-year cartoon playing a little boy, you know, at some point. But Dean was just so kind. He was so kind, and he always gave it his all. Um, Dean and I actually got to be in the booth together once when we were doing this game called Blue Stinger. A couple people have mentioned Blue Stinger. And so I got to sit as close as Pete and I are now and watch Dean do his thing for Blue Stinger. And um, man, he was, he was just a force to be reckoned with. What a great guy. And just very, very... Um, just giving me pointers about things and just passing on knowledge. Uh, just the sweetest guy. Sweetest guy. So sorry he's gone. You know, he had, for those of you who don't know, he had a heart attack, passed away tragically one day. Um, but yeah, fantastic guy. I don't think it would be any surprise to any of you that Mike Pollock is one of the most talented human beings that I've ever seen. Not only that, but like, as nice of a human as they come, uh, and I just, a, a consummate professional, so every time I've been around him, whether it's just hanging out and, and having a beer at SonicCon, or watching him in the booth, or uh, we, we did something uh, for actually uh, Greg, who's here, and Greg Hahn, who's here, uh, him and his writing partner uh, wrote, uh, did a cartoon, and me and, uh, and Mike and Colleen O'Shaughnessy did some voices for it. And when, when Mike brings it, you don't feel like you're very good, because that guy is so good. Uh, he's just one of the most amazing people, and it was an honor to work with him. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for turning and facing this way for so long. Yeah. We appreciate you. Thank you. And uh, Pete, thanks for having me on here. All right. Thank you for joining. I'm so glad you said yes. Uh, guys, we're over there. I know you know that, but please come and see us. We are and, the uh, in the corner. Yeah, and yeah. enjoy the rest of your day. Josh, thank you so much, man. Yeah.